Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog, and I have a very special guest today. Uh, this gentleman has been very patient with me, and we've been going back and forth for a couple years now, uh, you know, trying to uh, pin down a time where we can talk to each other. This is the writer of, uh, of Carnage, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, among many other things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, this is David Quinn. David, thanks so much for being here, and uh, while you're introducing yourself, could you please let people know where they can find you on social media and where they can find some of your work? Ah, uh, great. Great. Thanks for having me. Um, I know your questions are always thoughtful and interesting, and I like the way you read. And I'm grateful you read my stuff. So I, I'm reaching out in these in this year of uh, socially distant, remotely intimate um, engagement. <laughs> and I'm really trying to reach a lot of people. So I, I recently expanded my website, which is inwalkedquin.com. Inwalkedquin.com. And that's, uh, for years that was just a blog, which I only did occasionally. And now I'm trying to be more rigorous about a schedule for the blog. And I'm trying to uh, also flesh out the site with some media, some pictures, uh, some other stuff, uh, uh, including a, a, a small online store um, where people can, uh, if they can't find you know my stuff in their local comic shop or indie bookstore, then they can get a signed copy from me through the store. I'm not really set up to do huge commerce, but I can sign the occasional book and get it out to people. So that's in Joaquin.com, and I promise I'm trying to be, uh, you know, <laughs> attentive to uh, sharing things. I write about uh, the kids' books that I write. I'm involved with that a lot these days. Um, when I can, I talk about some of the media things that I'm always trying to sell, like, you know, media based on my uh, creative work. And, of course, some of the things that people have read and talked to me for years about at comic conventions. It, it's an online place to, to find some behind the scenes on that. That's stuff like Doctor Strange and Carnage and other uh, comics that I did on the indie side, the adult horror side like Faust and Night Vision and The Wrath. Excellent. Yeah, please, everyone, I encourage you to go check out his link. Uh, and I'll put that down in the description box below. So it's one click away. So you can go right there and check out all of his great work. And uh, and David, I mean, yeah, you've written some really great things. We're going to talk about a bunch of them today. But the main reason why, and obviously I do a show about Venom and we talk about Carnage sometimes. But the reason I really wanted to talk to you too is for, for actually for my viewer's sake uh, as well as mine, because a lot of viewers uh, who are coming in from the movie universe, they love, you know, the the prospect of Carnage being in the next movie, and they, you know, everyone thinks, oh, you can only do Carnage in rated R form. That's how. That's the best way to do him. He has to be mature rated, and and I always remind people that Carnage has been ninety five percent PG thirteen, um, you know, done in comics and cartoons before. I go except the one, the five percent, and one of that five, half of that five percent is your book, uh, Carnage: It's a Wonderful Life, which is a mature rated book. So, uh, so we're going to talk about that today, but I, I kind of want to start a little bit earlier and, and kind of get to know you a little bit and, and ask maybe where, you know, how, what drew you into the profession of writing and what, you know, were there comics that inspired you, novels? And I'm just kind of curious on that background. How'd you end up in the writing world? Uh, I think, uh, you know, I think collaboration is at the heart of all the writing that I've done. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm experimenting now with writing some novels and graphic novels for young readers, but I think everything I did in the beginning was was very collaborative, and that's that was probably the biggest thing that inspired me to do it. Um, co collaboration and one form, which is kind of funny in particular, helped free up um, perfection. Help help me banish perfectionism and free uh, emotion and and free expression. This was. Um, punk rock <laughs> that was actually the first career I, I, I attempted while still a college student um, and you know this was the era of the Joe Strummer Curtis Blow team up it was a time when punk had been around for a while in the early 80s and it was it was um, kind of crossing over really cool way with uh, with uh, with hip hop yeah. and what came out of it was urban and and, and, and uh, primal and exciting and uh, you know progressive and um, and I was all in on that so that's what I did uh, and when I was a college student it's a series of bands culminating with one called Dolce Vita here in New York um, and this is where I found out I could I could be the warm-up guy 
for Billy Idol or Thompson Twins or later Lena Lovitch or somebody like that. But I wasn't playing on their stage. I was warming up for them. And in the year that uh, Madonna, Springsteen, and Michael Jackson all had huge, huge, huge records, I had a indie record, <laughs> <laughs> which got great reviews at college radio stations. And we traveled up and down the East Coast and played. And, but the, the writing was on the wall for me. As much as I love music and wanted to keep that in my life, I had to find a, a better stage if I wanted to be a, a, the kind of a creator who actually made a living from his work. Uh, there's a lot of people who can make peace with the fact that they can be creative. There's nothing stopping them. They have a professional attitude about their craft, and they don't have to make a living at it. But I really wanted to. I didn't want to have to be a waiter or a teacher or a technical writer, all things I was doing at times. Right. But, you know, I really wanted to make a living as a creator. That's how I went through theater and discovered basically the same thing. I could be off off Broadway, but I wasn't doing the expensive theater production. I might I might have one day had ideas for that. Some interestingly enough, some of my ideas for Faust Love of the Dam started in playwriting. Um, but there was somebody who introduced me to an artist named Tim Vigil through Brooklyn College where I was teaching and producing plays. And all of a sudden, I had a door into indie comics, which I'm, I had happened to like, right? Since 1974, yeah. I've been a reader of comics. So it was quick for me to see, here is a new stage. Here's an exciting collaborator. Here's somebody who has the attention of people buying black and white comics. What can we do that brings all that emotion and a little bit of operatic craziness to uh, indie comics. Uh, I had the perfect partner in that, and after working together for a while and a few other things, we did land on Faust, which really kind of took certain tropes from superhero comics and horror comics and merged them with a completely other world of, you know, more extreme uh, horror, operatic violence, progressive uh, satire basically like trying to like play out the hypocrisy of the 1980s <laughs> right. and and, um, and that worked I mean the fact that that was transgressive and, and exciting for people um, whether you came to it for the, the splatter violence or you came to it because here were some people trying to do something uh, to really grab you and touch you and reach you and kind of rip your mind apart a little bit um, that that got a lot of attention so it was it was possible after that to not only get paid for comics in a way that was pretty happened to be pretty good at the end of the 80s early 90s but to find other people interested in my kinds of stories that's a yeah that's awesome I love hearing you talk about collaboration because I feel like that's something that's lost a lot when I, I talk to younger writers um, because I too like you I went through phases where I like I was a teacher for a while and I've I've done different jobs and all at the sake you know for working in comics and doing these other things trying to do both and uh, and I will talk to young writers and they always say like oh I have this idea I have it all planned out I have everything and I and I always you know tell them well just be open to other ideas because when you get into comics you know you, you have to talk to the artist you talk to an editor um, and you'll refine it and you'll actually you think you made it great but you might find ways to make it even better because other voices are on it and it makes sense for you too because you know uh, you have a music a musical background and obviously bands are a collaboration and and so uh, that's great to hear I mean I, I love hearing people talk about collaboration because I feel like it's not something that I hear discussed too often um, and uh, and so it does help us, like you said, it helps take away some of those emotions or those things that uh, you know ego a little bit. It helps it helps level you and and truly focus on what's most important for the for the story, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, every time I've had a collaboration with someone, every time they've surprised me with something that comes out a, a little bit different than I thought it was right. in my head, it's often better. I mean, there are a few exceptions of people that may be being a little bit lazy and they just did something that was easier and they didn't want to do, you know, they didn't want to try something hard. Sure. Because I also try to, every time I'm working with an, with an artist or a musical collaborator or, 
or, or an editor, I also try to push people a little bit. You know, I'll always try to push like, yeah, can you do a scene where there's no background and we're just going to have that negative space? Right. Speaking loudly. You know, <laughs> some artists don't want to do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Some artists, they, they want to, yeah, they, it's, you know, they want to put everything in there in the kitchen sink if they can. Um, but no, that makes sense. And yeah, it's, uh, it is good to challenge people. I talk about that all the time, uh, um, you know, working even in retail and uh, working as a teacher and things like that, that all, I learned that in all those professions. And so, you know, bringing them to something like comics is, is really great because I think by challenging and being challenged, you, you improve a lot from those kind of experiences. I think so. That's well said. <laughs> <laughs> so from Faust to Lady Death, uh, Doctor Strange to Carnage, you've definitely written some of comics' darker characters. Uh, what is it about these characters that hooked you in? Is it that um, that chance to do that satire that you were talking about? Is it the the blood and guts, a combination of everything? I'm I'm curious now. It's all of it. It's really the whole mosh. Um, you know, I know. <laughs> I know I sometimes surprise people with my work because they would say, you know, you're kind of a gentle guy. Um, why, are you, why are your people in your story so horrible? And, you know, I'd say, well, have you ever read, ever read Clive Barker? Have you ever read Stephen King? Have you ever met them and heard them talk? They're also, you know, yeah. capable of being both uh, gentle and savage. Uh, I keep the savage on the page, thankfully, which has kept me out of trouble and kept me alive to my maturity, uh, despite <laughs> despite the rock and roll uh, stigma. And, um, you know, there was a character named Blythe who was a tracer of monsters in a book called Night Vision I did for Rebel Studios. And actually several other publishers did little vignettes of the character, which was always very fun to do. Um, collaborator... Hannibal King co-created this with me. Mm -hmm. um, I found in the Talmud a great quote, this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. So I know this was Blythe's acceptance of her dark side, and I've accepted mine. Um, again, you know, I wouldn't have gotten to be uh, someone who grew up to be a, a husband and a dad and, and a, you know, citizen <laughs> um, I wouldn't have been that if I'd lived like these characters but sure. I definitely can inhabit that and, and one thing that I think is at the root of this is um, even as a kid I would read some pretty disturbing books you know sometimes it would be something typical like Dracula other times it would be something that would get a little bit crazy like the books of Thomas Harris about Hannibal mm -hmm. and when you push beyond the social norms with these characters safely through fiction I think it opens up possibilities of drama that and it's the kind of drama that doesn't just appeal to your mind it doesn't just appeal to your body and it doesn't just appeal to your sense of the invisible or the spiritual but it kind of touches on all of them so I keep coming back to some of these powerful books that I love so much I mean I go back to um Red Dragon and Silence of the Lambs is great examples of, of that kind of storytelling. And I think, you know, obviously, Faust is sort of my co contribution to that. And I got to do it in a, a mainstream way on characters like Carnage. Right. I um, I always find it fascinating because, like, nowadays, you know, there's a there's been this big push in Hollywood because of the success of Jordan Peele's work uh, in horror that... um you know, that they are reaching out to more comedians to do horror-based stuff, which I, I think is interesting, but I've always kind of knew that because I grew up around comedians too, and I would notice that uh, they inhabit the, the character they play to make people laugh, and in doing so, they can also inhabit the opposite a lot of times where they can go into a dark realm and write about dark characters. And so for me, you're perfectly normal to me. <laughs> like, uh, you know, you being, you being like you said, just a, a, a dad, a husband, and, and just like a what most people would say is a regular guy, uh, but to in, inhabit that. I mean, yeah, and I grew up reading those same books. I love Red Dragon, and I love Stephen King stuff as well, and um, and Koontz and all these guys. And yeah, I mean, they're, sometimes they act a little odd, but for the most part, they're just regular dudes 
dudes who are just trying to tap into a world and uh, that's what any great creative person does and so yeah like you said that leads you to stuff like carnage but before we get there i definitely want to mention that um you know one thing fans myself included will sometimes rail against is when characters get updated or they get new looks and this was something you actually were a part of at one point with dr strange and so i'm kind of curious about you know your run on Doctor Strange you had Steven look a different way when he was battling Salome and Nightmare and so what was that like ushering the Sorcerer Supreme into a new visual direction but also like bringing these new dark stories to him as well uh, I think I had the advantage of when uh, Marvel went out to writers to come and pitch a new direction Doctor Strange they were really open to a new direction it only came with one sort of uh, creative anchor, and that is it had to find a way to merge him with the Midnight Suns characters. Right. Because, uh, you know, comics history of the 90s is com complex. <laughs> but what we're looking at at the time that I was writing Doctor Strange is like the peak of a boom in comic sales based on speculation. And then the destruction the near death of the of the direct market due to a bunch of you know what they call distributor wars right. of uh, of companies like Marvel trying to distribute their own comics and basically putting a lot of stores out of business as a result. So I mean, a bubble burst and the distribution wars were a big mistake, and so we were going through a very crazy time in comics when all when it went from boom to bust very very rapidly. So. I went through trying to tell a creative story about Doctor Strange going through a personal crisis and how that would sort of change him. Because I thought, well, what do we do with characters that, that are ongoing for 34 years? They, ha they have a series of crises that change them, but they don't change them to a different character, they just change them through a phase. So I, ha I thought I had a very good organic way to break Doctor Strange down into basically three different magical manifestations of his personality and then pull him back together over a like two and a half year story and uh, you know i got to do most of the things i wanted to do fortunately thanks to people like um you know um bobby chase and evan skolnick the editors there mm -hmm. tom brevoort who was another editor i worked with actually the carnage editor um and um you know the only thing I really regret about that story, you mentioned Salome. Salome replaces Doctor Strange as the master of the mystic arts, and that sends him into a crisis. And out of this, he's going to come up with a more organic magic, uh, an Earth-based as opposed to Vishanti-based right. um, magic. In other words, he's not going to go to the three crazy witches for his powers anymore. He's going to build his own powers in, a, in based on the Chthonic Earth magic. Um, and, you know, they embraced the idea. Although the crisis of the month was, you know, how are we going to, you know, some books were just in free fall in terms of sales during these distributor wars I was talking about and the bursting of the bubble of, of people buying multiple, multiple boxes of copies of books. So Doctor Strange being one of the mid-range books they had, uh, it wasn't, you know, tanking. But everything was in free fall. So everything was getting changed. If you go back to that time, everybody gets a new costume. Well, not once, but twice in right. the early 90s. Yeah, yeah. And, and so then they said, you know, okay, well, this story has been great. But now can, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you finish up the story, make him younger. And <laughs> so, so that was going to be another thing. Like, oh, younger, okay. Younger in itself. Is that enough? I don't know. But let's try. I was always willing to try. But, you know, people, editors were getting fired right and left every day during that time. It was a very, very um, kind of sad time to work at Marvel. They were outsourcing their characters to image creators. It was like, not that that in itself couldn't possibly produce great comics, but at the time it just felt like, you know, a sad, a sad day. I would go up there and there'd be dark offices, editors just sitting in the office with their head down on their desk not the hubbub of insanity that it had been before that and that it is again today you know creative insanity i should say happy creative insanity 
<laughs> anyway, um, I like, I like, I'm not sure why, oh, I was saying, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing what I was trying to say. I was talking about Salome. Yeah. I wish I'd made Salome more complete, more rounded, more tragic. Like, she had the potential to be Dr. Doom to Dr. Strange. But rather, I think she was really more like Doomsday. She was kind of just a big, bad, powerful role player who existed to blast him out of the picture and then let him win again once he changed his power to this new Earth-based magic in this creation he called the Forge. Right. But we had a lot of fun, and the people responded to the energy and the insanity, first with a lot of WTF, <laughs> and what are you doing, and you ruined this. But other people like making those early issues, even though they had to be, no choice there, had to be part of a crossover with all the other Midnight Suns, you know, Morbius, Ghost Rider, Blaze, all those guys. Right. I like those characters. In particular, Morbius, I had fun using. Um, but people responded. There's a blogger named Ben Herman who writes about Marvel Comics, and he wrote recently, like, you know, it was dark lunacy, and it was off the wall, and, you know, I, it kind of reminded me of Neil Gaiman and Grant Morrison's work at DC, and I, I took that as a, as a compliment, because those are a couple of creators who came up in the class just ahead of me, so to speak, and I respected a lot of what they wrote and their approach, and they wanted to try to have some serious fun that was both serious and fun, and, and get a little dangerous, but also still play within, you know, Marvel Comics. And DC Comics, right? It's it's something to do to work on those those stages, you know. It's also something to do to do your own thing, and I can say that because I've done it, and I'm also doing it exclusively now. I haven't done any work for hire since 2000, except outside of comics in business writing. So I mean, you know, but it's if you're going to play on those stages, you want to try to make it some serious fun, as I call it. Yeah. I get it, and I gotta encourage people out there. If you and I'll, I'll be honest, the only Doctor Strange stuff I've ever read, and I've been reading comics thirty plus years, has actually only been that '90s run. Um, I've actually never read anything outside of that, and I, I don't know if it's it's same with Ghost Rider. The '90s Ghost Rider is stuff I really love, and I think it's just uh, you know I'm trying to get back into those characters now. But I, I did love what you guys did with that book. And actually, I, being a Spawn fan, too, I actually really like the look of, uh, of Doctor Strange, a, a fan of his, you know, Spawn and Nightwatch. And I like the new costume. And I encourage people out there, if, yeah, you got to check out his run. And actually, it's all available on Comixology, which has been great. Uh, that's been a fun resource to have whenever things are no longer in print. Um, so I always recommend people go check it out. I mean, I, even though digital comics, I'd prefer a print comic, obviously. But hopefully, you know, we can get a, a reprinting of these, uh, you know, when the next Doctor Strange movie comes out, especially since you tell nightmare stories in there, because uh, I heard rumors he might be in the next movie. So, um, yeah, man, I, I love your stuff, and that makes it's, – it's, it's fun to hear you – talk about that but it's also tragic too because i know and i've heard stories about that time at marvel and i know how hard it is on, what was on editors and workers there and like you said it, the 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 ramifications of the decisions they made as a company to other businesses and um yeah and we're seeing a little bit of repeat in history with that now too so it's uh it, it's i always say though sometimes that that hard times those tragedies help birth new things but yeah at that time in the 90s it was fun because like even Ghost Rider had a new red and yellow costume soon after uh, your Doctor Strange run so uh, <laughs> it's just a crazy time and in, indeed in, in dark dark lunacy for sure um, was it your you know so like sh shifting uh, you know uh, to Carnage because um, I obviously the rest of my questions are about Carnage I love to hear you talk about the character so when it comes to Carnage It's a Wonderful Life how did you end up working on that book uh, starring Marvel's most famous serial killer? Tom Brevoort, the editor. Um, Tom and I had lots of good conversations about what made good stories. Um, we happened to be fans of a lot of the same things. And I think he kind of wanted to take, uh, I don't know, I'll dare to speak for him. I think he sort of wanted to see if he could get away with doing a few of these um, carnage stories with people like um, Warren Ellis and mm -hmm. David Quinn and Kyle Holtz and maybe maybe others he was considering uh, if, if it would have been you know something that continued um, take the character out of Spider-Man put him in a book where he's the protagonist well, what kind of story are you going to tell then um, and 
obviously, I just thought of this the other day. I don't even know if I thought of it at the time, but uh, I loved Marv Wolfman and Gene Cullen's Tomb of Dracula when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's a book where you take Dracula away from his role as the villain, and you're going to try to tell us his story. Uh, they did a great job of that, and that went seventy some issues. Um, when I met and worked with Marv at um, at Malibu, I was oh such a fanboy <laughs> to tell him how much how much I appreciated that and how influential that had been on me in putting together an ensemble of interesting characters and letting them be circulating around the crazy villain in a book named after the villain. So I mean, it was kind of perfectly organic and obviously Tom thought of me and trusted me because um, there had been like a little bit of adjacency between Warren Ellis and David Quinn we worked with some of the same publishers we worked on some of the same characters um, he would go do something and then I'd follow him or I would do something and he'd follow me right. he was the one who wrote uh, Doctor Strange after me Right. so, <laughs> so um, you know it, it was a good fit and Tom turned out to be a very wise editor. He really let me and Kyle Hodes be ourselves. So um, Kyle and I, had, you may know, had done half a dozen comics together across different characters. He actually did one of the very fun uh, installments of uh, Blythe, Night Vision. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it was just a lot of fun to do. Um, I wrote the script quickly. It was like the fi my final days of writing things for Marvel. I was about to like, just like, uh, be done there. Um, I was writing a bunch of scripts very quickly for Marvel and Malibu's Ultraverse. Right. Um, what was left of it, and that played out through the end of the nine 90s, mm -hmm. and then I left work for hire at, at the end of the decade, at the turn of the century, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, that's a long answer. This <laughs> I ended up on that book. <laughs> that's okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's it's, but it's neat oh, though. I'm, I'm, Tom Brevoort is obviously the short answer, but I, I like that you talked and you speak so highly of him and and uh, and his work and how you and Warren followed each other and and Holtz, I mean, I'm such a big fan. We'll talk about him here in a little bit, but he drew some Crow comic. I'm a big Crow fan um, by uh, J James Obar, and and Kyle did some of those early Crow books. And uh, once I saw that he was going to do something for you know carnage at marvel i was like i gotta check that out and that's kind of was like oh wait this is also the doctor strange guy like so it was <laughs> so i i've been yeah i've been a fan of if i can fanboy out on you now i, I fan you know I, I was a big fan of you since then so <laughs> um, uh, you let us be ourselves like i said I, I wanted to make carnage both more alien but yeah. also more human like you see him shift shift his form wildly which kyle draws beautifully that sort of body orders body horror squiggleness and transformation and like the characters squeezing through the plumbing and through wires and they had to you know downgrade the computer system otherwise it'll go across the ethernet you know <laughs> and we just like i just went wild with the ideas that i could and you know it, it's 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 also a story i think we'll, you know, i've seen some of your ideas for questions i think we'll talk more about this later but it's also the question that, a story that tries to make him not only more alien, uh, but also more human. Thank you all for listening to part one of my interview with David Quinn. I will have part two up tomorrow, so make sure you come back. Make sure you stay subscribed so you don't miss out on it as well. And uh, it was a lot of fun. You know, he's awesome. And as you can see, we are ending the episode right as we're getting into and sinking our teeth into Carnage, It's a Wonderful Life. And the rest of the interview is pretty much us just focusing on Carnage, Billy Bentine, you know, uh, the man wolf, you know, John Jameson, um, Ashley Kafka. And it's just us talking all about that. And I thought that was such a great segment to just keep as one solid episode and kind of have this be the teaser and talk about David's other work. And like I said, I didn't want to put out another, I've been putting out a lot of uh, one hour episodes lately. And I know some of you guys haven't, you know, kind of prefer me to break things up into two parts. So that's what I wanted to come back and do in this one. So hopefully you guys liked this episode. And if you did make sure you stay subscribed so you don't miss part two, it'll go up tomorrow and happy 4th of July to you. Thanks so much for listening.